Good. Okay, and so I think that we are live at this point. And so today is Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. This is our biweekly meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Um, so first thing in just sort of comments for me, the only thing that I wanted to bring up is schedule. And so Aaron, thanks for putting out the schedule for 2021. Um, we had a placeholder or two for December. Is there any need to do that or that January meeting is going to be our next meeting? Um, <clears throat> right now, I don't have any new applications that have come in. Um, it's, uh, I am anticipating getting an application for the January 13th meeting. Um, but I haven't had anybody, um, you know, really uh, expressing that they need us to, t to handle any business prior to that. Um, it's, it's difficult to predict because tomorrow I could get, you know, five requests for extension and three, you know, requests for certificate of compliance. So it's, it's kind of tough to gauge, but right now, I'm hoping that um, things will quiet down over the holiday so that we can just start fresh in the new year. Okay, so at this point, keep those available if we can, but nothing on the books. Okay. Yeah, and if something urgent arises, um, I will reach out to you, Brett, and we can kind of uh, strategize. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, so um, with that, so um, Dave, do you wanna go next? Sure, I think Aaron might have a slide. I do. Let me get that queued up for you. Just one moment. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Can you get okay. a little bigger, Aaron, or no? Um, did you, does that help? That's that's better. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'll be very brief because um, I know Aaron's got a lot to cover. So yeah, I, I think the theme really for this month is. <clears throat> wrapping things up out in the field in terms of land management for the winter. Um, as you know, um, Brad is now uh, on his own. We did lose our assistant land manager. I can't remember whether I brought that up last meeting or not, but Tyler Pease, uh, who's been with us for about three years as the assistant land manager, took a, a really terrific job uh, for the city of Westfield. So um, uh, he left about a week ago. So we are in full search mode for an assistant land manager. If anybody knows anybody with, um, you know, kind of great skills uh, in uh, forestry, in land management, working with tractors, chainsaws, that kind of thing. Um, we've had great luck recruiting uh, young people from the Stockbridge School at UMass, but we're open to other folks applying. I would imagine uh, that the posting will be up on the town website probably by the weekend is my guess. This is a 40 hour a week job, full time, full benefits. And uh, yeah, we're looking for a, a great person to, to work with Brad out there in the field. So we hope to get somebody hired in January so they can get on kind of on board with project planning and then and hit the ground running in the spring. So Brad is solo out there. He's, uh, he's trying to finish up as much brush hogging as possible. It's actually a great time of year to do it. It's dry. It's it's um, relatively easy to work in the fields. All of our terrestrial turtles have headed to where they spend the winter, which is typically out of um, uh, open fields and meadows. So um, it's a good time. It's a safe time to do brush hogging. So Brad is, is all over town trying to do that. Um, he's doing some minor bridge repairs. Um, I know that uh, we've gotten some great reports from volunteers about bridge problems at uh, on the KC Trail and a few other trails. So Brad's trying to knock those off before winter really sets in. <coughs> and 
And then we've got some great volunteers um, who have been hitting the trails uh, all fall and they continue to do great work. If you've been to Larch Hill recently, they've done quite a bit of uh, just brushing back trails there. Um, so there have been some benefits. Some of our volunteers have been on reduced schedules at their work and they're looking for outdoor things to do, safe things to do to get some exercise and feel productive. So um, we've, had, we've had some really wonderful people help us out there. Um, and then project planning for the winter, really in January, we'll turn our attention to 21. Hopefully for all of us all around, it'll be a better year, but we'll be looking at um, you know, trail improvements on the Robert Frost Trail. Um, we got a lot of that work done this year, Brad and Tyler did with volunteer help and some uh, part-time staff. But we have until June 30th, I believe, to finish uh, all the Robert Frost Trail uh, improvements that we were funded through the, the state on. Uh, we'll be working on, on kind of plans for doing some of the bridges that we finally have funding for and telephone poles for and things of that sort. And we'll be working with the Gastro Trust on various trailheads, such as at Podick, at Ritchie, and Sweet Alice. And then Erin and I have been talking in her new expanded role uh, about trail maps and standardized kiosk uh, uh, education materials and outreach materials at our trailheads. So um, that's kind of what January and February will look like. So I imagine we'll, you know, the department will be coming before you with some requests and or notices for some of those projects to kick off in the spring. And um, yeah, I actually have some funding uh, to hire some, some folks. Uh, this is through the CPA committee and some other sources. So um, uh, we should be able to get quite a bit done in, in 21. So um, that's kind of where we're at. It's budget time here in town as well. <clears throat> so overall the budget, we'll be preparing budgets now for the town council to review and the community to review uh, in the spring months. Um, uh, we're gonna do all right this fiscal year, but certainly next fiscal year starting July 1, and then uh, the following fiscal year, which will be uh, fiscal year 22 and 23, you know, we're gonna really feel municipal governments will feel the effects of COVID uh, in those years more than they are in 20 because we've been bolstered by uh, money from the federal government. Uh, and the state government. So um, 22 and 23 are going to be tough years. Um, fortunately, we have some capital, unspent capital money that can only go to certain projects. So we, we've got some, some funding to get some things done. So you'll hear more about that. And I hope to get Brad in here. I think Aaron is working on a date to get Brad in to do kind of a wrap up for 2020 before you um, sometime in January, I hope. So that I'll stop there. Oh, I, yeah, I will mention finally, I, I, I forgot Hickory Ridge. Um, I, I sound, I, sometimes I listen to myself talk about Hickory Ridge. Um, land projects take a long time. They just do. And, and um, I've worked on projects for 15 years and finally closed on, on them. And people kind of don't believe you're really going to close on it. This one is not going to take 15 years, but we are still pushing forward on Hickory Ridge. I am still confident it will happen. Um, we're still working with the solar company and with the current owner. Um, I have a meeting out there tomorrow uh, with some folks. So it's moving along. It's just it's just kind of slow going. So it'll it will happen. Good. I'm confident it will too, Dave. Um, will you send around the announcement for Tyler's position, and I can circulate that in a couple of listservs. Yeah, that'd be great. We will do that. So excellent. Yep, that's disappointing hearing about his loss, but congrats to him. Does anybody have any questions for Dave? I don't think I, not. Uh, why don't we turn it over? If I could add, Brad, one, uh, Brad, one more thing. Um, um, we are a wonderful springboard, career springboard for uh, various individuals through the years. That assistant land manager, we, we now have somebody working for the Westfield uh, Tree Department. We, uh, I recommended another assistant land manager to work for the uh, Boise, Idaho Tree Department. We have one person working for the Mass Fishing Game. And then there's two or three others. Um, we tend to keep people about three years in that position and then they decide to move on. But it's a great starting job, entry level job, and people get, get good experience and then they go on to do bigger and better things. So we will get you that job, job, uh, job announcement.
Yeah, great. The only challenge would be starting in January. But yeah, I definitely have some people in mind. Yeah, we're flexible on that. I mean, you know, we've got to give people time to yeah. if they have other positions or whatever. So. Okay, Aaron. So um, we have two items um, on the um, docket tonight, which are um, related to open space management. And um, I believe I see one of the people, I believe Roxy um, is on for that, for one of those items. Um, if anybody else is on for one of those items, um, if they raise their hand, we will um, recognize them. Uh, but um, I'm going to just make uh, Roxy a panelist because I believe she's on for our um, the donation of the poetry box, I think was the item she was on for. Um, OK, and so these are just going to be kind of brief introductions tonight. Um, I think was the idea, Aaron, and then we'd have a longer discussion later if need be, or? Yeah, so um, uh, Roxy was interested in the, uh, in putting a, a poetry box on the Emily Dickinson Trail, donating it um, to be placed there. Um, and then the Historic Walk Project is a project that was going before CPA for funding. And um, just with how much business we have on the agenda tonight, we were thinking maybe get an introduction and then we could assemble sort of more details to get final approval for some of these. Okay. If that sounds good. Yeah, so Roxy, if you wouldn't mind giving sort of a brief introduction about what you're proposing. I'd be happy to. Thank you for allowing me to come. Uh, and it's nice to see uh, everybody's faces here. Um, I, my husband, um, I've, has lived in South Amherst for the majority of his life. And um, we've been living here for 40 years and uh, he passed away last year. And he was a local educator and he was a teacher and a lover of poetry. And I thought a way of uh, honoring his life is to set up a poetry box. And, um, and in his name, I would love to do this. He walked the conservation trails every day um, and he was on the um, Emily Dickinson Trail a lot with, with our dog. And I thought that was the, a really perfect place. Um, I could think of several places, but um, you know, it seems like just name alone, that would be ideal. Um, and uh, and I, I proposed this to the town uh, through David and, and I would love to show you a couple of ideas. I have, a, I have uh, somebody who's willing to build something and I thought just installing a post and a little sign about what this is for and people can leave their poems in the box. Um, a lot of towns have done this, but not, you know, you don't see them often, but I've never seen anything like this in Amherst. And um, except I have to say that I did find one at Amherst College on a one of their trails and it's they just have a little mailbox and there's always poetry and uh, and something stuffed in the box. And I thought it might be nice to every couple of months pull it out and post some of the poems in the Amherst Bulletin and say, you know, here's some of the poetry that you know, people have been leaving. And um, so it might be kind of a nice way for community to enjoy, um, you know, sharing poetry with their community. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that does sound very nice. Uh, it's very compatible with what we have available. Um, so Dave, a question for you, I assume that, you know, if uh, Roxy's able to donate the materials and all of that, then somebody on um, the conservation department and the conservation department would be installing it yeah we we really haven't spoken at any great length but um i know this was just a, a couple minute introduction but yeah i mean certainly we could install we'd have to talk about 
I'm not sure if there were one of these or or a number of these or one at the beginning of the trail, end of the trail, but the Emily I'm Dickinson just thinking of one. Yeah, one. I, I'm yeah. Keeping so it street, keeping it very simple. And I was great. actually thinking of it in the quieter side of the trail, which comes out to Mill Road on the southeast street mm -hmm. edge. So that'd be real that'd be real easy. And of course, as the commission knows, you authorize the installation of the storybook trail, which is in the um, lower Mill River um, conservation area. So um, in fact, on the Roth Park end of the Emily Dickinson Trail, there used to be some sort of a, a guided walking interpretive uh, huh. uh, trail. There, there was a box there with with uh, with guides that you could grab mm -hmm. at one end and 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 deposit at the other end when you were through. It's long since deteriorated. So mm -hmm. I think this is a great. Um, it would be a great experiment. Um, I would I would just advise that you know um, let's try something like this and see how it goes. And and um, you know we have to be prepared sometimes that people might leave things in there that um, of course aren't you know, nice or yeah that you would want to remove if they were offensive mm -hmm. or anything like that. And that that kind of thing will happen. But I think it's a great idea and a great way to you know kind of enhance some uh, you know a trail in this case the Emily Dickinson Trail. So. So who would I talk with for the design of this? Um, and hopefully we can install something in the spring. Well, like not unlike what we did with the trail up in North Amherst, I think um, the applicant there was Coles Lumber and they, um, the Coles company, and they submitted the design to the department. We gave them a little feedback and then Ultimately, it came before the commission, and the commission liked it and and gave the thumbs up. Okay, I um I didn't even realize that the, the town could do the installation. Um, I I I have I have a son who's been working for the trustees of the reservation for five years, and he is looking for something else. And I thought he would help me, but I'm going to ask him to apply for your <laughs> assistant. There so, you, you know, you, I'm killing another uh, bird with, with a, a stone. So here, but anyway, um, I thought he would be able to do the installation, but perhaps you guys will want to do it. Let's put it this way. If we pick a location and you and he want to work together, sure. I'm sure Brad, Brad has loads of things to do. So if we pick a location and the commission says that's yep. a great design and you want to do it as, as a, son, a project with your son, sure. uh, no, no worries there. Okay. All right. So I will um, put together some sort of uh, description of the installation, I think, or is there somebody I should talk to about what they would require? I mean, I, I would love to have a little sign just explaining it. Um, and you, could just, you could just mock something up and send it to me on, on email. Okay. And All we'll, right. we'll make it happen. And, and give you some feedback, Aaron and I can give you some feedback. And then when we think it's ready, we can bring it back to the commission and-, and Okay. We'll Thank you so much. This is real exciting. Okay. Do any of the com other commissioners have any sort of questions about this? Very straightforward. Yeah. No, I think it sounds great. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. I don't know if anybody has ever walked on the Leverett trails because they do have a poetry um, a series of poetry boxes and um oh god and so you know that's where i you know i hit the idea of you know this this is something that amra should have uh, mm -hmm. but Excellent. or if you've ever seen the one at amherst college trails um uh, oh well Great. so yeah so thanks a lot for thinking of it and yeah we look forward to seeing this and yeah look forward to seeing it out on the trail Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye -bye. So I will leave the meeting so you guys can talk about everything else. Thank oh, you're you more much. than welcome to stay. This is all um, open to the public, but yeah, we'll put you into the general meeting part. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Aaron, do you remember who the person is who uh, is associated with the other? with the historic walk project, are they here? So if the person- 
I don't believe that they are here at the moment. Uh, There's but a Robin who joined. I don't think they are, but I can also give a quick overview of it since they came to CPA, if that's helpful. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, and if they are, they can raise their hand, but I'm not seeing the folks who came to CPA for it. So um, essentially what they are seeking to do is there are a, there's a variety of historic sites along the Mill River Trail. Um, and so it's the, uh, the District 1 Neighborhood Association that put forward the initial proposal. Um, and it's going through a little bit of a kind of a, a I guess rigmarole would be the best way to, to frame it with CPA, just trying to make sure that their application fits within the bounds that CPA is restricted to. Um, and so we're trying to work with them on, you know, coming back to us with a proposal that we can actually consider thoroughly and, and not have to um, not find fault with basically. Um, and so what they wanna do is they want to take these historic sites and um, do a couple different things. They wanna make it a historic walk um, where the sites are labeled with um, descriptions of what they were. Um, they are not going in. I made them promise me up and down that they are not going in and disrupting anything. They're not doing any digging. That was a promise they made. Um, but they're basically going to put signposts in saying this used to be a mill or a and one was a button factory. There was some sort of factory or something. I might be making a button factory, but they were essentially going through the history and and stating what of each of these cellar holes were, what the brick wall or what the um, stone walls used to be, uh, the bounds of. Um, it's kind of similar to the the Mill River, uh, not the Mill River, the um, what's the land the the North Amherst Story Walk one, um, except that it's historic sites, right? And so um, they are they're basically not creating a new trail. It would be along the existing trail, explaining what people are looking at. Um, the other part of their proposal was, was talking about just making sure that those sites stay um, as preserved as they are right now and doing some sort of some sort of academic work around them. Again, not with digging, but just at looking at um, what the sites are, where they're, when they're from, um, and trying to get as much of a historical record as they can. Um, they had submitted it under historic preservation and my one of my comments to them during CPA was, you know, at some point you'll need to loop conservation in. Um, and so they, I think that might be why they're starting to come to us now is, is that it, it is on conservation land um, and it's, they know that they're going to need to talk to us at some point. So did I miss anything, Dave? It was my rambling response of they're putting oh, that was great. That was great. I, I did, I did. <laughs> have a parallel conversation with Meg Gage, who's one of the, um, you know, applicator, you know, proponents of this uh, project and, and suggested that this, you know, they, they come to the commission. I will say that this one has, uh, to me, a more uh, official feel to it and, and kind of a permanent feel. Um, if, if we do this as a community, I, I think, I think there's a lot of reasons to do this and have this be permanent signs as permanent as signs can be. Um, there's a lot of great history along the mill in Cushman Brook, Mill River in Cushman Brook. So um, I would see this as, as a more formal uh, design. We would really want to get well into the design because I could see these being up for many, many years. And, and we've all visited historic parks and, and historic sites and conservation areas with historic elements. And I think we'd want these to be just top-notch signage, well-researched and um, and professionally done and and uh, put into to weather many many years. I don't see this as a as a temporary installation, you mm -hmm. know, that might be gone in a year. So, I think it's a great project. The question is, can the community find funding to do it if CPA is not the right uh, avenue? So, and they are coming back to us. It was tabled. Um, they'll be coming back to CPA. I believe in January is the the plan right now. Mm -hmm. I will say, just quick follow-up, um, we might in the spring put up some timber. I, I don't like signs. I'm kind of, I, I don't like sign <laughs> pollution, but we were made aware that some of the stones from some of the mill sites upstream of Puffer's Pond do have a way of migrating a little bit when, when people start to make dams up there for swimming of dogs and people. And it just would be a shame if, if more of that happened. So we may put up some temporary signs saying something you know about what a historic site this is because those those wonderful stones that were brought in for the mills make great you know temporary dams but then they're gone 
on the mill site. And there's a couple that are close. I can think of two uh, swimming areas where people have, you know, put in these dams, which I'm not opposed to, but taking the stones from the mill sites is a little troubling to me. So I do, I do also think, I mean, to kind of zoom out for a second at this year, we've seen a lot of different requests for signage and talking about the idea of kind of sign pollution is not, doesn't seem like a bad concept for us to think about how many of these trails and conservation areas we're allowing to have things like story walks and historic walks, which are great, but also, you know, can't be on every single trail and, and right. conservation area. So at some point it might be worth us having as a commission, having a conversation about what parameters we want to set around that um, as well. Yeah, we've got Bluebird Meadow signs as well. So there's yep. 2020 there's has a been lot. This, a, yeah. a lot of discussion about signs and what do, what do we say about consistency and- Right, and, and do we have a design standard? Is it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and I agree. I mean, I, I had gone out to Amethyst Brook <laughs> just to look and to do some kind of site evaluation, and I'm like, kiosk, and there's like all these little signs all over the place, and then there's like our trail signs, and I'm like, mm -hmm. this is, it's it's like at the entrance, there's like 10 signs, and I'm like, this mm -hmm. is, you know, it'd be nice to consolidate, you know, and just have one with boiled down information, um, mm -hmm. and I just, yeah, I agree. But I, th I think that the other thing that would be really a good um, long term plan is to like identify properties where these types of walks are appropriate, like say maybe three or four in town designate these will be areas where we'll allow it and then in other places we're going to keep it more of a natural feel. Um, other towns I've worked for they've done similar things like if there's like an ADA accessible trail. Yeah. where there, it's more um, of a well-groomed trail and there's stopping points for resting and stuff like that they might put mm -hmm. a sign in but like for trails that are more like a single track trail they'll they wouldn't allow something like that so right you know, kind of general mm -hmm. thinking about the landscape and what makes sense mm -hmm. similar to zoning mm -hmm. you know like <laughs> yeah you yeah, know, basically. Master planning for open space. Right, right. Like somewhere like Hickory Ridge, it would make sense to maybe do something more along the lines of a story walk, whereas, you know, up in the Holyoke Range or some of the trails even around around puffers, right? Like they're they're smaller, they're less, even though they're well-traveled, they're not as, I mean, like you said, they're single track, right? Like they're not as built maybe as the framing. Question: Are there are there is there documentation and so forth at the Jones Library about these historical places in Amherst? So there's some, I believe, um, that there is some documentation. But part of their proposal, and I'm my brain is feeling a little fuzzy on whether or not this stayed in their proposal. Part of their proposal was to work with um, people at UMass, and at some point they wanted to hire someone to do um, to do the the historic work and the um, archaeology. The no, no dig archaeology. I, really I think that's really neat to do. It's a really cool project, um, and I, I think it's really important. I think the the question is just for us: is is this disrupting too much of the natural the, the natural conservation land that we're protecting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think the historic issues of the of the town are something we really want to keep track of. I mean, this happened to me a number of years ago. I went to an auction and bought a fly rod. And when I took it home and looked at it and so forth, it was made by the Amherst Fly Rod Company. Oh, that's so I cool. didn't know there was an Amherst Fly Rod Company. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, it, I pass it on to my son, but it's like it's, right, something important to keep. I mean, Larry, I agree with you, but I also think that that's the job of the historic commission, right? And so like our job is to put the, the land first and their job is to put the history first and we need to come yep. together and figure out where that happy medium is. I agree with you, um, I agree with yeah. you. And so, Anna, this whole thing that they're proposing—do you know if it's all yeah. on Concom land or does it go? On it is, yeah. Okay. It's all. It's all on. It's all on the. It's the Mill River Trail, right, Dave? Is that what it? Yeah. Okay. And it's all, yeah, all on conservation land. Yeah, and so you may just want to mention to them. I looked at the proposal briefly, and it looks like mm -hmm. there's a lot of money in there to hire somebody. But yes. I don't know if there's a lot of money or any money in there for signage and that sort of stuff. So I believe that there was, but I could be, I could be, I haven't looked at it. In a I week. could be wrong too. There was two lines. I just remember that the big line was hiring somebody. I don't remember the second line. I will say either way, they're coming forward with a new proposal. So um, that is, we're, we're waiting on that. We're making sure that they um, kind of are aware of how to do it. One of the conversations we're having at, at CPA is, 
um, how are we supporting our community in writing these proposals and, you know, talking, talking to them about coming to us for advice um, first is something, you know, like talking to them so that they have a proposal that says we've talked to conservation and they think this is a great idea. Um, so we're, we're working on that, but there will be, I believe, a modified proposal, if not a completely different, completely restructured one coming um, soon. So it sounds like this will come before us again. And so we'll have something a lot more formal at some point. So this is just kind of a heads up. Mm -hmm. uh, but does anybody have any other questions? So it's 7.30 now, so we can start our first hearing uh, if there's not. No. OK, so thank you, Anna, um, and especially kind of doing that on the spot. So well done there. <laughs> OK, so I have just after 7.30. So um, Aaron, is it OK if we start our 7.30? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so I saw that Mickey is here, and I don't know if there is anybody else here for this one. So Mickey, you should be able to speak in a second. Um, so this is a continuation of a notice of intent um, that's being brought before us by SWCA for dredging at uh, the UMass Pond. And so um, Anna and I did a site visit with a few people from UMass and SWCA about a week ago. And so thank you for setting that up, Mickey. Um, that was helpful. And so Mickey, do you want to give us a, a brief recap of where we're at at this point? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, good to see you all again. Um, hey, uh, Lawrence, I just want to also say that the Pelham fly rod was in that factory below the old um, Amethyst Brook Dam. Uh, and uh, the fellow who used to own that factory kept examples of the fly rod for years and it's all changed and the dam's gone, but that's where it was. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, you may, so we filed this uh, notice of intent, you know, about a year ago uh, and I asked the commission to put it on hold until it went through a review process. Um, following uh, the MEPA certificate, which was issued in September, we were told to go ahead and reopen the hearing, uh, which Aaron's uh, did. We had met with you two weeks ago. Um, we got a verbal approval that um, the DEP Boston Dredge Division has approved the project, but I don't have that in writing yet. Uh, and so the only permit that's waiting is um, there's the, the last time we did work on the pond, um, the university developed a memo of understanding between the university. Mass Historical Commission, Army Corps of Engineer, and this uh, group called Puma, which is sort of like a UMass historical group kind of run by Joe Larson. Um, and it had to mostly do with revegetation and keeping the historic landscape of the pond. So uh, we were asked by Mass Historical Commission to revise the memo understanding following dredging, and that's still in process. So anyway, that's the last piece of the puzzle. Uh, I, at this point, um, I think we're okay to proceed with answering any of your questions or closing um, this hearing. Um, the work is tentatively scheduled for the summer uh, of 2021, uh, but it will depend. There was funding allocated for this by the university. Uh, a lot of things have changed, um, but it's designed to be a summer project. So for whatever reason, it doesn't happen in 2021, it'll be summer 2022. Um, and the only change that we had to make through the water quality certification was to add um, a plastic liner underneath where the dredge material is stored. And so th there's a note added to the plan and that, that was the only change they requested. So um, I think that's it. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Yeah, Anna and Brett and I, uh, Niels and Valerie went for cold early morning walk last week. Yeah, and um, if I could just jump in, um, I, Mickey, I had been in touch with Mickey previously about sort of um, coming up with some suggested conditions that he felt like would make sense for this project. I also um, looked at the MACC um, boilerplate conditions for dredging, and a lot of them aren't really applicable to this project. Um, there are a couple that are. Um, 
So I don't know. I mean, I read through the um, conditions that Mickey sent me and I think that they look great. Um, so I sort of just recommended that the commission include those as part of the order of conditions, as well as including standard boilerplate under our local bylaw um, and also under Wetland Protection Act. And then there was a couple um, that I had sort of plucked from um, the um, MACC guidance and I can pull those up really quickly. Um, yeah, so like just including the boilerplate and then the draft conditions that were provided by Mickey. And then um, let me see if I can make this a little larger so we can actually see it. Um, so like the first one, I mean, this is talking about spawning fish, um, protecting spawning fish habitat during the dredge. And I don't, I don't know how others feel, but just knowing the configuration of stormwater structures that, that, um, filter water into the pond. And then there's a sort of a series of stormwater structures at the outlet as well, from what I understand. So it doesn't really seem appropriate to include conditions for spawning fish. Um, there was a condition here for um, mechanical dredging, uh, specifying the type of equipment that was going to be used. No hydrologic or uh, pneumatic equipment shall be used for removal of dredging material. I'm not entirely sure I understand that because I'm not familiar with the specific um, terminology of that um, condition. Um, from what I understand, like on number three, it says all dredge operations to be conducted from upland areas. From what I understand, that's just not possible due to the size of the pond that they're, the intent is to dewater to the point where they can get machinery into the pond to dredge it. Um, that's what I understand from speaking with Mickey. Um, so I don't think a lot of these conditions aren't necessarily applicable. Um, the number five is definitely applicable, which we could include. Um, dredge material should be dewatered de and disposed of in an upland, upland location. We we're already planning to include that anyway. And then siltation fence and, and drainage uh, ditch to be installed at the dewatering area to ensure no material from dewatering area enters adjacent wetland area. That was already included in the plan as well. Um, and then um, there was, I just, I had had a question for Mickey about um, what type of machinery was going to be entering the pond specifically. Um, and he is unsure about that detail. So what he had suggested, and I think is a good idea is to just request that once the contractor is selected that they provide um, documentation to the Conservation Commission about what vehicles are being used so that we can have documentation of that for our records. Okay, thank you, Erin. And could either you, Erin, or you, Mickey, um, just go over the other sets of conditions as well? Sure, Mickey, do you wanna do that or do you want me to do that? Uh, why don't you do this since you have control of the screen? Sure. Um, While she's pulling that up, I, I just will just add that the, the conditions that I uh, sent to Aaron is I, I just went through the notice of intent and just picked out all the things that the applicants said they would do and had agreed to and just made sure it was highlighted and pulled out so that you know all of you and Aaron didn't have to you know wade through the notice of intent. And while she's pulling that up, Mickey, um, I think when we were out in the field, they were waiting on a final um, soil test. So things were looking good. There was a hot spot, but she thought things were going to pan out okay. Did that end up being the case? Uh, you know, I know they grabbed the sample. I, I haven't seen the analysis, but I put in these conditions that um, the commission would get all subsequent reports. Mm -hmm. So in the notice of intent, you had the original soil sampling. Uh, and I just want to make sure you get copies of future sample results. Uh, 
Uh, the, the only other thing I'll, I'll add is that there's some information here about water levels. Um, that, that had to do with the memo of understanding between the university, Mass Historical Commission, Puma, and Army Corps of Engineers, and, and that elevation was set. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that was in here, that you know, the universities uh, previously had had a higher water level and there were some objections to that. So um, it's um, elevation 216, it's set by the outlet structure. Uh, the, the university has the ability to lower it for maintenance. Uh, there's also an agreement with the town DPW that if there's a storm event, University can lower the level of the pond to accommodate more stormwater, but it, under normal operation, it, it's supposed to be set at a certain elevation. And all the bank plantings, everything, have been geared to that elevation. Yeah, it was impressive the amount of um, water it could potentially hold if there is a storm event. So that's nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so other commissioners, any questions? I mean, so this is, we've seen this one before for a while. Um, I don't think there's any sort of big surprises at this point. Everything is pretty straightforward. And it's a big project, no doubt. Um, one thing just kind of be aware of whenever this does happen, I think one reason during it's going to be during the summer is it's going to stink. So just don't be too surprised when that happens. But I mean, it's, you know, it's dredge material from the bottom of a pond that has a lot of geese. So. <laughs> yeah. Very nutrient rich. Um, and then the other thing that I found interesting that you were talking about, Mickey, when we were in the field was things might actually get a little bit worse the year after the dredging. Um, would you mind just going through that real quick that it might get worse, but then it'll get better? Yeah, so um, right, right now, probably twice a year um, is a algae bloom and the pond is treated. But uh, what I've seen in other ponds is following dredging, there's just a, a lot of release of nutrients. So even though you're taking this nutrient rich soil and removing it, it it's still not removing all of it, right? Um, and so it just tends to be a nutrient rich soup and uh, often the year following dredging, there are algae blooms. And the expectation is that it's gonna need less management in the future. But uh, initially my, my guess is we'll see an algae bloom. Okay. Yep, and there's nice things in place for how to handle a fish and all that sort of stuff. So it feels very comprehensive. Yeah, th there was um, some work done about, I don't know, six or seven years ago on the north end of the pond when the dike was rebuilt. Um, so it was dewatered and we had a wildlife biologist and they moved fish and frogs and turtles and uh, they, they were able to accomplish that. And I think that's the the same idea here. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so again, any other commissioners have any questions? Any other observations that you made, Anna, when we were out there? Okay. You you covered mine. So. Okay, um, so are there any questions from the public? If you do have one, you can just use that little feature to raise your hand. So I'm not seeing any. Um, Aaron, given that there are still a couple of things that are open on here, are we okay to close on this tonight? Um, open as far as it the like outstanding permits? E correct. Um, from what I understand from, from Mickey, um, the, the only permit that's outstanding is awaiting our order of conditions. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we're good to, to issue at this point. Um, and if we needed to amend, you know, if something came along, we could always amend it if necessary. Okay. Sounds good. But yeah, I think we're ready to issue. And, um, I would just make sure that anybody who makes a motion include these, these three items on the screen. And then, um, I have an additional three, from the other slides that I could, you know, just, just run through if somebody wanted to, if, you know, to make it easy for motion making, let's, let's say. <laughs> and if you can also help us with which boxes to check, that's always helpful as well. 
Yeah, so this is an actual order of conditions as opposed to a determination. So um, it's just a to issue the order of conditions. Oh, okay. Um, no yeah. Great. Yep. Okay, so if there are no other um, comments on this one, Aaron, if you want to run through that, and then if somebody wants to make a motion based on what you say, we can move forward. So um, the conditions that I would recommend would be for us to include the town of Amherst boilerplate um, conditions uh, under special conditions, as well as the Wetland Protection Act boilerplate conditions, and then to include the conditions that were drafted um, by Mickey Marcus for the order, as well as um, just an additional condi condition that would um, further support that um, dredge material would need to be dewatered and disposed of, disposed of offsite, that <laughs> protection would need to be in place to prevent dewatering material from entering the resource area, and um, prior to work starting that we would want um, documentation from the contractor regarding um, the types of equipment that are going to be entering the pond. Excellent. Can I make uh, a comment gonna... before you go mission reviews? Um, Aaron, when you say um, off-site, so um, what uh, has been proposed to DEP is to, uh, once the dredge material is dewatered, it actually gets moved uh, to the Tilson Farm section of uh, the university. So it's actually on site, I guess. I guess when I say off site, I mean um, outside of resource area or well and protection act jurisdiction. <laughs> okay. Yep. Outside the project area is what I was yeah. thinking. Of. Yeah. Okay, looking for a motion with what Aaron was saying. So moved. Um, second. second. Okay, excellent. So uh, voice vote at this point. So Anna? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I from me as well. So thank you very much, Mickey. This has definitely been a long process and um, this one's kind of wrapped up, but I'm sure you'll be in front of us relatively soon with something else. Thank you all for your time on this. I appreciate all the attention that you gave to this project. Bye now. Peace yeah. Okay, um, so moving on to our 735, which is a notice of intent for Conservation Works Kestrel Trust for installation of 400 linear feet, at least that's how it was initially proposed, um, of bog bridging on town of Amherst Pota, Conser Pota Conservation Area. And so I think I saw Pete was here. And so Pete, you are now a panelist. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody else here for this one, if you just raise your hand. Um, but if not, um, let's make sure that Can you, you hear me now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can hear you, but not see you. But that's oh, we can. Oh, now you can. can see you now. All You're right. Good. Hello, everybody. So I'm back, and uh, I can update you on the if you all remember the bog bridging proposal. Uh, last night, the Hadley Concom uh, approved and signed off on the project on their side of the town line, uh, which, uh, okay, so the way they looked at it was two separate segments. The wooded part, several hundred feet in the woods, they approved with the condition being that after the bog bridging is in, we, we spread some grass seed on some of the muddier areas. And then uh, they approved the crossing of the food bank field, several hundred feet of bog bridging there. And the condition was that we needed to provide 56 square feet of replication. So we presented a plan for replication and they approved it and we'll do that in the spring. So now we're looking at the Amherst part, which started out as a proposal for uh, both both Podic and Catherine Cole, and now we're focusing on Catherine Cole. And the, the total length we proposed was 220 feet, linear feet. 
and um, it, I think some of you were out on the site inspection. Have, have, how many of you have seen the site? Yeah, so a few of you. I know Aaron's been out there. So um, what, what we're hoping is for approval of the bog bridging in the location specified. Now, you, you may have seen Aaron's communication suggesting after the delineation that was done by Dave Haynes that we look into uh, a reroute in a couple of places. And she can describe that more thoroughly, but I know one of them was just west of the, uh, for, was what is shown on the map as a 40 foot bridge that's already there. The Hartford Fern population is just to the west of the, of the bridge. And the trail goes through it, but uh, my impression is, and I'm, I'm very familiar with Hartford Fern, um, that it is doing fine with uh, the trail uh, near the populations. People are not trampling it. It's, it's okay on either side. And it's actually a trail attraction. It's great for people to be able to see that. And there's quite a bit of it. So I wouldn't consider it to be um, uh, necessarily fragile or in, in jeopardy. So my thought is that the trail there could stay and we aren't proposing bog bridging anywhere in that vicinity anyway. The nearest bog bridging is 600 feet to the west and that is in a, on a site that Dave Haynes identified as Upland. Um, and then I think Aaron was, was suggesting another reroute uh, farther to the west uh, Aaron, you correct me, but uh, it, it seems to me one of the concerns I have about, about rerouting any trails, and we, we build trails all over the state, is that it's tempting to say, uh, yes, you can put in a new route um, and avoid difficulties with the old route, but, but it's not easy to close a, a route that's been in for quite a while. I looked at a site down at Wilbraham a few days ago where uh, an eroding trail uh, had been equipped with a reroute around it by the Hamden or by the Minnetonk Land Trust in Hamden. And uh, the upshot was, and then they, they equipped it with signs and blazing and they buried the old trail with brush and logs. But a few months later, the brush and logs are gone and now people are using both routes. So you have kind of a double problem. The, the eroding section is still being used. And I, I, I kind of worry that trying to reroute here just might add to our difficulties by creating a second trail uh, with the first one being somewhat difficult to close. But I'll, I'll let you go from there. Any, any questions or any additional information from Aaron? Thanks, Pete. Yeah, closing trails can definitely be complicated. Aaron, do you have something that you want to add? Yeah, I mean, so I totally respect Pete's um, perspective on things and his knowledge and background of trails. I'm going to always come at this from how do we protect wetlands to the maximum extent we can. And um, so, you know, we, we the commission, the, the town hired um, David Haynes to go out and do a wetland delineation. Now, as part of our original, um, the original permit that was filed, the plan that was associated with that showed 240 linear feet of bog bridging going through wetland. And that was according to the DEP wetland layer. Um, once we um, whittled that down to areas we knew were wet, it significantly reduced the trail uh, or the bog bridging locations in wetlands. So we know it's a lot less than that. Um, if we remove the small portion that David recommended that we reroute in order to avoid a wet, an existing wetland and also in order to avoid uh, state listed protected species, 
then we could bring it down to 170 feet, which is reducing from the original application on Conservation Commission land, reducing the amount of bog ridging and wetland from proposed 240 linear feet to 170 linear feet based on the information that we got from the delineation. And from that 170 linear feet, if we were to remove that one section with the reroute, it would bring us to the total, basically square footage footprint of the bog bridging in wetland would be 28.47 feet, according to Pete. That was a calculation, um, which is down from 40 feet. So that, I mean, that's, that's the recommendation from the consultant who looked at this. And I definitely support that we try to limit foot traffic through the wetland if we can, um, and also limit putting, you know, bog bridging in wetlands if we can, if we can reroute the trail through upland. I think that that is um, the most prudent thing to do from my perspective <laughs> as, you know, offering you a recommendation. Of course, it's up to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think either way, it's, it's the, as, as Pete noted, it's, it's a difference from removing that section of trail. It reduces the square footage of footprint of the bog bridging by, I think, just under nine square feet. So it's not a lot. It doesn't reduce it by a lot, but it does reduce it. So it's really you guys call in terms of how you think is best to proceed. Um, one idea I had was if we did do the reroute in that section in order to avoid the climbing fern and in order to avoid the wetland that the trail is currently going through, that we could um, use, the, use the funds from Eversource that was provided to us uh, for mitigation to put up a sign that tells people this section of trail is closed to protect wetlands and state listed species. Um, but again, it's uh, just just a suggestion and it's Conservation Commission managed land. So um, that that's basically um, kind of where I'm coming from on it. And I'll just put the, the um, but I add one thing, and that is that uh, Natural Heritage looked at our application, and they they are well aware of where the the uh, Hartford fern is, climbing fern, and they approved the project, and and added that they recommend bog bridging where necessary to protect uh, plants. But bear in mind also that the area where the Hartford fern is is not an area where we're proposing anything. So I, I, I am dubious about the, the value of, um, of trying to move the trail away from, from that site. And I've, I've mentioned the reasons. Um, okay. I also sure. think that it, it's good to bear in mind that we're, we're talking about really a minuscule area uh, yeah. of impact. I mean, a difference of nine square feet is is something you could almost stand on with two feet. So I I, I would kind of hate to see a lot of manipulation of, of trails and landscape to accomplish that level of result. So that's my thought. I mean, we'll, we'll be quite careful in putting the bog bridging in and uh, we'd be glad to, to to seed the uh, the braided trail areas where you know use has spread out and, and created muddy conditions, but um, I, I I guess my recommendation is that if we could refrain from relocating in this situation, I think that might be better all around. Yeah, and I mean just to present kind of a, an alternative is that if that reroute was done, that section of trail, if it was closed off, could be considered mitigation. We could, you know, seed it down and um, try to restore that wetland back to, I mean, it's compacted. The trail's compacted. It's been used for decades. Um, 
So I don't know how successful it would be, but I'm just, just throwing that out there as an alternative. And there are some sections out there that would be easier to shut than others of that trail. Some of those trails are pretty well developed. Yeah. Um, is that area, would that be easy to shut down or not really? Because uh, I'm worried problem, with what people- The problem there, Brad, is that you're right next to the end of the bridge and there's very little room between the bridge and the Hartford Fern to put in your barriers because you really need barriers if you're going to be uh, closing the trail. So if you put logs, you put brush, you put signs, you're, you're right on top of the Hartford Fern where it starts. So uh, I, I see that as something of a problem. Maybe better to leave alone because the Hartford Fern is doing fine. Yeah, and I mean, my other concern is if we do try to re locate and we do try to restore if we do get people going through there they're going to do more damage than than we're saving so yeah okay um yeah so i also appreciate what you're saying aaron yeah obviously the less disturbance we have in wetlands yeah we're all for that so okay so other commissioners we have a little bit of a um decision point for this one, um, but also just sort of broader questions about the project too. And so it was great to get the, um, the wetland specialists out there. So thanks for dealing with all of that, Aaron. And so that's helpful. Yeah, I think it's, it's useful to see where the resources actually are, because I mean, we, we were, we were, based on the DEP comments, they were assuming, you know, 240 linear feet of impact and it ended up being quite a bit, quite a bit less than that. And also that area shown as extensive wetland is not actually as extensive as, as those layers show. So it just, for me, it's more peace of mind that mm -hmm. the impact isn't as, as drastic as what the initial perception was. Yeah, peace of mind and due diligence. Yep. Okay, so other commissioners, you have thoughts on going one way or the other on this one? I'm good with keeping the trail where it is, not relocating it. I, uh, it seems like, as people are saying, a lot of disturbance for very little gain. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Leroy. Anyone else? Um, Greg, could I just weigh in? Um, Please, Dave. Um, yeah, so this is my old stomping ground as a kid, so I, I know I know the area pretty well. Um, but yeah, this is a real tough one, I think, and I know Aaron and I have had conversations about it as as, as Aaron, Pete, and I, and um, yeah, I, I find myself kind of going back and forth here. Um, I am, I am, I think most struggling with the fact that our experience with closing off sections of trail has not been great. Um, and I worry, I, I do worry about kind of increased traffic out in this area. I think as, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, the Kestrel Trust project was great on the Hadley side. But um, if you promote it, um, people will come. And so we're already seeing a lot more traffic in Podick and Catherine Cole. Well, Podick, we're not seeing as much because the trail is impassable, mm -hmm. so, thanks to the beavers. But Catherine Cole is definitely seeing a lot more, more foot traffic and, and dog walking, et cetera. So I'm a little bit torn on this one. I think I do want to thank Erin. I think the due diligence that she uh, put forth on, on the town side uh, for the commission was was very helpful in really outlining where the resource areas are and where they're not. Um, but I wonder if, if we kind of work this to a point of, of good compromise and, you know, we'll work with our, our colleagues in Hadley and, and try to kind of do this as responsibly as we can. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm struggling thinking about the understory out there and, and it doesn't it doesn't work that well for not creating two trails um, where, where today there's only one. 
and and we don't want to get to that point where we have more braided uh, situations out there. Um, Aaron, I'm just kind of curious where you know you've made your case on on wetlands, and I think it's a very valid case. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, it, we it, we have struggled mightily with with blocking off trails. We've gotten to the point where even when you put up a split rail fence with signage that says ecological restoration area, we have people taking down the signage. We have people taking down the split rail fence. Um, so it, it's challenging. Yeah, and and that's something I don't really have an answer to. Um, I just. Um, I'm just always going to err on the conservative side to protect the wetlands and protect the endangered species. I mean, I, I hear all sides of this, the, the argument. Um, I think one thing I keep coming back to is the, the square footage of wetland alteration from the bog bridging that's proposed. And, and again, for me personally, as, as a, you know, person who's worked in this field for a long time, I don't see the bog bridging footprint as being an alteration. That's just my opinion. DEP sees it differently. They see that as an alteration. And so I guess my question is, do we mitigate that? You know, and you know, the, the question of moving the trails, one question, the other question is, do we mitigate the presumed alteration that the bog bridging footprint would create. So it's kind of a two part quandary um, as to maybe the best. I, maybe possible. I could mention that we've had uh, some good discussions with Scott Jackson recently about DEP's policies uh, just just related to this kind of, uh, of small project and, and trail related project. And he's quite interested in um, encouraging DEP to back off from the, the very rigid uh, position they tend to take in, in our region, because that's not the same position that's being taken in other parts of the state. Hmm. So I, I, I kind of think we're on, we're on pretty safe ground um, pr proceeding with this one and, and then looking to Scott's help in, in working with DEP on future situations so that, you know, the entire trail community isn't squeezed by higher expenses and more difficulties in permitting some of these very minor uh, impacts. Yeah, it's not like this is a new trail. I mean, this is an existing trail, so it's an improvement overall, so. Right, it's been there for at least 40 years, probably more. I mean, from, from my perspective, I would think that the tr I, I can see both sides, but I could see the relocation being an opportunity to try to restore the old portion of the trail, and that could be considered mitigation. I would also see that as being somewhat of an olive branch to DEP and saying we're trying our best to avoid the wetlands to the maximum degree we can. Um, so, so that's kind of that's kind of how I see it. Like the relocation could be a win-win in that we restore the portion of trail that is historically altered and move away from that sensitive um, um, species, uh, and we could consider that to be mitigation for a relocated section of trail that's outside of the wetland. An uh, idea. An idea. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add one, one thing, and that is relocation on paper is one thing, but whether you're actually accomplishing what you want to, I mean, I think Dave was right. It's, it's not easy to, uh, to get these things relocated. So um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be leery. Yeah. Yeah, people are pretty hard to manage. So. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think my opinion here is um, I, I think that we should sh should not uh, relocate the trail. I think we should keep it as it is. Um, I think that Dave, you bring up a really good point. And I mean, just hiking the trails, I see it a lot when I'm out hiking, people just doing whatever they want to do. Um, so I said, but I also hear your point, Aaron, you know, um, and I think 
you know, um, acknowledging that we want to do what's best. I just think that, um, yeah, I think I think that I'm I'm more in alignment with Leroy on this one too. Both alternatives are improvements. Potentially. Well, maybe we could look at this as kind of a model project so that uh, people keep a close eye on, on the process and the bog bridging construction and, and any impacts. And, and of course, we'll do everything we can to uh, keep, keep even temporary impacts to, uh, to a minimum and concede back the muddy spot. So I, I think we'll have a good situation in the end. And it's something that can be monitored and, and used as an example, I hope. How do you intend on keeping impacts to a minimum? Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm sorry, what was that? I said, how do you intend, you mentioned uh, keeping impacts to a minimum. I'm curious what your plan is for that. Can you speak a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. so the bog bridging would be built as we go. In other words, we would be, we'd lay down one section and then mm -hmm. walk on that to get to the subsequent section. They'll be tied together at the, at the middle. You see a lot of bog bridging that mm -hmm. has separate sections and one goes up and the other goes mm -hmm. down. But if you tie them together in the middle, they, they don't. And so uh, the idea would be to avoid trampling on the surrounding ground and stay as much as possible on the bridging. We'll have to get off uh, to do a little bit of leveling, but uh, we'll, we'll try to do as little as possible of the uh, aimless walking around, you know, the, uh, the work site. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any other questions or comments from Commission on, I mean, so we have to first deal with the relocation issue and then the mitigation issue um, is sort of a separate one. I'll stick with, uh, it's not, I, I don't want to see a relocation of the trail. I don't think it's a good idea either. So if that helps, then we can, three okay, so of us, four of us. I'm with that. Okay, so I think, um, yeah, I don't hear any opposition to that. So we're good on that one. Um, so what about the mitigation issue? So, I mean, it's, you know, it's on existing trail. Um, but yeah, it's kind of weird what that DEP ruling is, but that's DEP. Well, that's how I, I just don't, I agree. It's already existing. We're improving the walking. I don't know either. Like it's like uh, this whole project is about to improve this whole area. Um, yeah, so I guess I'm also with you. <laughs> yeah, and you guys just just from the standpoint of our bylaw and also Wetland Protection Act, if the alteration is less than 500 square feet, you guys have the authority to approve the alteration without mitigation okay so that is within your purview to allow that to go forward without mitigation that's pretty much what the hadley commission did with their with the wooded parts of of their proposal mm -hmm. yeah. okay so any other sort of comments or ideas Um, so is there anybody from the public who would like to make any comments on this? You can just raise your virtual. Actually, can I just ask a quick question? Um, sorry, um, Pete, with, is there any um, talk of, or maybe Dave or Aaron can fill in about um, improvements to the trail head? So pulling in and parking. So the Catherine Cole, if you know, when you pull in the park, it's kind of a grassy, gets pretty muddy. Is there any talk of that in this yeah, project? Dave, I apologize. Just, but Kestrel has already been busy uh, putting a plan together for some better parking with a gravel pad. It, it won't be big, but it'll be right. a good bit better than, as you know, the, the muddy situation and, and season is pretty tough for parking. Yeah, and I, I want to give Kestrel credit because they are actually offering some funding there, but um, 
yeah, the initiative really came from us as we were acquiring Zala as part of the uh, the uh, the larger Zala property and uh, project in Hadley. So we've known for a long time that we wanted to improve the the parking and the trailhead and the appearance and the you know the entryway there is pretty rough right now. There is the um, the small barn that's to the left to the um, south, which is owned by the Valley Light Opera. And so um, I met with them over a year ago, and they're actually offering some funding as well to improve the condition of the, uh, the old farm road there. So um, Aaron and I have been in touch with Kestrel, and, and um, one of the people that Pete works with at Conservation Works. So we, are, we have a plan in place that we'll bring before you during the winter, pretty straightforward for a you know, a crushed stone parking lot, pretty simple, probably some split, split rail fence to define it, a nice kiosk. Um, and then we'll have to clean up our, um, our um, um, some of our uh, wood chip pile to the, um, to the north. And then of course we do have the beaver issue that I think uh, hopefully is gonna be addressed through Eversource to try and reduce the beaver population a little bit in Podix so we can get the water level down so that you can actually use the trails and have a loop trail in Podic. So there's a lot going on there, but 21, that's kind of one of our big initiatives is to get a much better um, approach there, Fletcher. So you raise a good point. You might be interested also that, that Kestrel, maybe you already know this, but Kestrel for its 50th anniversary is assembling a list with maps of 50 trails around, this, around the valley you know, to, to help with, with dispersed use because, you know, everybody tends to go to Amethyst Brook, but let's, let's make sure people have lots of opportunities and, and this will be one of them. Nice. Okay, so do we have any more comments on this one? So are there uh, orders of conditions associated with this one besides our standard boilerplate, Aaron? I mean, to me, this is a relatively simple and straightforward project. I would say include um, our boilerplate conditions for both state and local, and also um, conditions that were outlined by natural heritage. Um, as part of the issuance, um, I would, I think, you know, issuance of a statement of fact might be appropriate to attach to the order of conditions just basically to state exactly what the commission's perspective is based upon the review that was done by our consultant merely to say we you know we view the bog bridging as an improvement over existing conditions and that it will actually improve the um, um, uh, compaction issues and the damage that's happening from the existing trail and that relocating the trail we don't think would provide very much benefit in a you know looking at sort of cost benefit analysis and that um, the old trail could still be used and abused um, just to kind of put it out there for D DEP the rationale that the commission used in the decision making process might be something you'd want to consider, but um, if not, I mean, I think it's it's a very simple <laughs> it's a very simple project, to be honest. I mean, it's a very simple permitting project, so I don't I don't really have any concerns. Even there's no real excavation taking place, no real veg removal taking place. Um, it's it's a very simple, straightforward trail project. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, so with that, we're looking for somebody to take a stab at a motion. <laughs> Anna's pointing to herself. No, I'm saying not me. <laughs> I, can, I can do a Larry and say so moved, but I feel like we really need to spell this one out because we did not spell it out like Aaron did last time, and I'm not sure I can do that. That's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, the one well, thing you want to do is reiterate. Um, I can't remember exactly the statement of issue. No, nope. issuance of statement, statement of issuance, something like that. Statement of fact. Statement of fact. Yeah. Laura's unmuted. I'm yeah. going to just. 
<laughs> All right. If you walk me through it, I can do it, Aaron. I, I just don't want to mess it sure, up. Sure. Sure. Okay. You. So I'm pulling up my notes here. All right. I'm ready. So I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. So the recommendation would be to issue an order of conditions that includes um, special conditions, um, the local boilerplate and state boilerplate, as well as incorporating conditions um, outlined by natural heritage in their approval and that the commission could issue a statement of fact which outlines the rationale for the bog bridging being an improvement over existing conditions preventing long-term alteration and damage to the wetland and relocation of the trail providing minimal benefit To the resource area. I would even I got go Larry, if you say with, so moved right now, I'm gonna be so mad. What? Well, I'd even go a little bit further with the potential of relocation doing potentially doing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I agree with it. All right, I'm ready. So um I move to issue an order of conditions that includes special conditions, local and state boilerplate, and incorporates the conditions outlined by natural heritage in their approval. Um we should could also issue the commission could also issue a statement of fact or just that I'd like to are. do we yeah. are issuing sorry i'm i should have written this and not in third person um <laughs> could issue a statement of fact which outlines that and i'm outlining it right here the bog bridging is an improvement and prevents long-term alteration and damage to the wetland and relocation of the trail would potentially do more harm than good so we are not going to recommend that or ask for that i second that Anna. thanks laura <laughs> Oh, well done. So looking for a voice vote. Taking Doctor. notes. Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So we are good to go on this one. Great. Thank you very much. You guys did good work. And we'll let you know uh, before we start work out there, of course. So if, if anybody wants to come out and look, that'll be great. It'll be, I'm guessing, April. Yeah, looking forward to the improvements out there. So, yeah, thank okay, you. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. So, uh, we're moving on to what is listed as our 740, which is a request for determination. So, I need to officially open this one. This public meeting is now being called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40, the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands protection by law. This is being brought before us by Bacon Wilson PC for U Drive South LLC for relocation of residential structure on the corner of Snell and Baker, map 13D, lot 55 with associated site work in the buffer zone. So I think I saw, oh, Aaron already grabbed it. So Tom. Here um, I am. Good evening. A long time no see. Yeah, so, no kidding. Good to see everybody. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst here on behalf of U Drive South. Thank you. And if you could um, provide a little setup that'd be most appreciated. Sure. Yeah. And, and Aaron, I don't know what, if anything you have, I can always share my screen, but essentially this is a, a property at the corner of Snell street and Baker street uh, in Amherst over by one university drive South, which if you'll remember uh, you issued an order of conditions you issued, I think um, a determination of applicability or maybe a, a delineation a few years ago, this um, project, this parcel is adjacent to that parcel. It's the same delineation. Uh, and so what Barry would be looking to do is actually to relocate a single family home from South Pleasant Street. It's a uh, circa 1862 building. It's an Amherst College building. Uh, it's a single family residence. And to actually pick up the house and move it down to this uh, lot, and so what we've done is um, you hopefully will have a, uh, have a plan in front of you or have had the opportunity to look at a plan showing we're staying entirely outside of the 50 foot wetland buffer. And I think Leroy and uh, Aaron were there today. And I think Aaron has some suggestions based upon what we saw on site. 
And I think, you know, we'll just say we're amenable to all of those suggestions. So we can update the plan after, and Aaron, I don't know if you want to walk through those, which obviously I'm more than happy to do, but yeah. you may want to. Um, sure. We're, we're, we're happy to update the plan to show that. Yeah, so I'll just, um, sorry, it it's it, for whatever reason, PDFs are having a really hard time opening on my computer. Um, so it's a little tricky for me to get it open, but um, just to give you kind of a, a quick view of the site, this is um, U Drive South coming in. You'll remember we just permitted a project um, on the other side of U Drive South. Um, this shows the, the boundary of the house lot with the proposed house location the wetland boundary. Um, this was filed as a RDA because it's the, the work was proposed to be over 50 feet from the wetland. Um, and from walking the site today, sorry, I've got, I'm, you know, the reason this is complicated is I'm jumping from um, screen to screen so that I can share these with you. Um, and I'll, maybe just for the sake of simplicity, I'll show you the plan first with my markups or kind of suggestions. And then I can show you pictures so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. And this is a scan. So the quality is not fantastic. Um, so my first observation is, um, you know, uh, it, it's been, we've gotten a lot of precipitation and it's also been kind of cold the last, um, few weeks. So um, if you're if you're standing on Baker Street looking at it, there, there's a very in this general area of town, there's a very sort of country drainage um, configuration. Um, Baker Street is is tilted like this, like so that water can sheet flow from one side of the road to the other. And um, it doesn't appear that there's a whole lot in terms of catch basins and things like that along the roadway to capture stormwater and, and treat it under, under the surface. Um, that what you can see on the plan um, that's already shown here is that there is a partially paved, what's well, called a paved waterway, but portions of it are paved along the edge of Snell Street and then it comes down into a catch basin on the west side, I guess this is of the property. Um, from walking the property today, what I observed um, was that there is water coming off of Snell Street sort of in this general area and it's moving. Um, there is there is sort of a, um, a channel. I wouldn't describe it as a, I mean, it's certainly not a stream it is a, a channel-like configuration. It looks to have been designed to carry water down into the exact location where the catch basin is on this end. Um, there were some wetland indicators in portions of it. There was some sphagnum moss, there was some sensitive fern in, I would say like sort of select areas of it, but for the most part, it was an unvegetated, um, you know, there was leaf litter all over the ground. Um, and I'll show you pictures of what it looked like in a second. Where this little star is, there's a little section of Phragmite. Um, and you know, what's really interesting is across the street from Snell Street, there's a drop inlet catch basin that goes under Snell. And I believe that carries the water under that residential property in that vet's office over to the Phragmite that's on the other side um, going along Northampton Road where we just permitted um, uh, Mass DOT to do their little road expansion. So there's Phragmites over there as well. But um, the only source of water appears to be just road drainage coming off of there. So my suggestion was to add that to the plan and label it as a drainage swale um, and um, to add a culvert going under this driveway because what's happening is water is sheeting off of Snell 
and I believe it's moving in either direction into the swale and then down into that catch basin. And my concern is that if this driveway was put in that you're basically going to just have water pooling on one side or the other and it's not going to be able to move where it wants to go. Um, and the other thing I was going to suggest and that I suggested in the field was that the limit of work and the erosion controls be moved so that there's like a 10 foot offset from that drainage channel to protect it to keep um, the limit of work outside from impacting that that drainage swale and also um, to surround this little wet pocket here that's along the road with erosion um, with straw wattles as well during construction to keep sediment from entering it. And I'll just show you pictures so you can kind of see the extent. When I talk about this, it sounds like it's, um, it's, it's really not very extensive. Um, give you an idea of what it looks like. <clears throat> so this is um, standing in the middle of the lot looking east and you can see the little patch of Phragmites can you guys see my cursor? Okay. Yes. See a little sorry, patch. Of... Your car's on Baker Street there. My car's on Baker. Yep, exactly. Yep. You can see a little patch of Fragmity there. This is looking out towards the intersection, so you can see it's 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 upland over in that corner, but that's that's pretty much where that drainage swale starts is along the road. This is looking. Is that, is that you you drive in there and the, the road that was there was that you drive? That's so, Snell Street and Baker Street. Baker okay. Street comes out on Snell. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this is looking at the house lot location. So this this is the house corner closest to that um, Snell Baker intersection. So I basically just turned around uh, 90 degrees. And then this is standing out um, along Baker, looking toward. Snell, and you can again see in front of Tom there that little little fragmity patch. That's and you can also kind of see the the slope of the roadway there, how it's leaning. This is a photo of some of the water, and here's the the little drainage swale that I would call it. There was no real flow observed in it. Um, there wasn't what I would describe as you know standing water so much as I think it's just it's surface water maybe groundwater that's just moving in that direction. This is the catch basin that both of those swales flow into and then and this is looking up toward the, the paved swale that runs along Snell Street. This is again looking from the woods sort of into that little, you can see there's little wet pockets in there um, from the, the road drainage. But that's what that looks like. And those are my suggestions to Tom and he, um, I, Tom, you got my email late in the day. So none of those things were a surprise. Okay. No, no problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Tom. Um, so one question for me, just to kick it off, is what's going to be the treatment for the land? And so obviously some vegetation has get removed. I assume they're going to put in some sort of foundation. Um, and then how, what's going to be the extent of land clearing and how are the future landowners going to know where that extent is going to be? Is there some sort of permanent demarcation? Sure. So great questions. Um, maybe starting with the last one first. When we were out in the field, Erin had suggested that we just mark, because one of the representations that we had made to her and to Dave throughout the process was that we weren't going to, um, the limit of work was going to be the 50 foot wetland buffer. And so, you know, we put boulders out there, I think is what we talked about in the field, because they're the most permanent that, that you can get versus some other things that you could put out there. So we would go and we'd put those boulders out there um, just to make sure that, you know, kind of in perpetuity, mm -hmm. people know where it is. And then as far as the, the land treatment, so the idea is to 
in, and I don't know if Barry's on, but he can probably speak more eloquently and educated about how it's done. But um, so you pick up the house, you know, you put some beams under the house, you pick it up, you bring it onto the road on South Pleasant Street. We'll head north to the center of town, take that left, go down Northampton Road to the, in, yeah, I know, to the intersection that you drive south, take that left, hopefully, I, I think on the uh easterly side so you know it's like a divided um way that you drive south so we don't have to go through those traffic lights so you you take that left and then we'll end up coming into the site from that direction and so we'll have to build some sort of you know we'll culvert the that drain coming in from that west side and barry will have wagner wood build some either it's a swamp mat or some sort of bridge because then the truck will literally just drive over the site will have been cleared no more than the 50 foot wetland buffer with sensitivity to that drainage swale and then there will be a cellar hole dug um and then what barry says is you bring the house you put it over the hole and then you pour the foundation and then you put the house down onto that foundation uh, I think leaving room for the beams that it's setting on and then my guess is you take the beams out and then fill in the rest of the concrete and then that's that. And then um, I think he was saying that he would like to do the driveway first so that any subs, you know, for the electrical plumbing, because it's really just reconnecting some things, get the park on the driveway so we're not worrying about tracking dirt out there. And then, um, you know, we can work with Aaron just to make sure that whatever sort of site grading is done at a time and in a way where we're not, we're, we're conscious of sediment, you know, sedimentation and also tracking onto the roads. And so that's kind of the overall picture of how I think, you know, we, Barry, we see it going. Okay, and how far back is lawn gonna go? It's a great question. Um, no, frankly, no idea. Okay. Okay, because that um, is often the other issue. So if we know how far lawn is going to go, and then just sort of standard lawn conditions, meaning no fertile, no um, inorganic fertilizers um, and other things that could be deleterious to yeah. the wetland. That's fine. I mean, I don't see any issues with any of those conditions. I just don't know the extent of of where that lawn is going to go. Okay. So, and I would, I would recommend that as part of the determination of applicability that we include the same standard boilerplates that we would for, you know, um, state and local law for approval that would outline those same things that Brett was just talking about. There's, we have boilerplate in there regarding the use of fertilizers um, and herbicides and pesticides and things like that. Um, and there, there were, just as a side note, there were quite a bit of invasives on the lot in the location where the house was going. And, um, I understood, I mean, generally when I see invasives, I would say that there be a requirement that the invasives be removed from the site and properly disposed of. From what I understand, that material is going to be chipped by Wagner Wood and then it's taken, um, to be burned at the, um, I'm not sure which Hosp hospital. Barry said the hospital. I'm not sure which one, but yeah. some hospital must have some sort of wood Cooley fired. Dick. It's the Cooley Dick um, Hospital in Northampton. There you go. Perfect. They have a wood chip boiler that clean does all the sanitation and heating and cooling for the hospital. Excellent. It's pretty sweet. Excellent. Yeah, that's so that's where it's going. Okay, thank you. Um, so other questions from commissioners on this one? Just to be clear, so we already saw the wetland delineation from uh, around the corner where you're building the apartment building. For the whole site, yeah, because yeah. this, okay. this, yep. this was just carved off, uh, I don't know, maybe earlier this year, I want to say. Got it. Cool, just, just confirming. Sure. Yeah, the wetland boundary carries up beyond, there's like a, um, a fence, like almost like a, um, a pasture fence that runs behind the back of the property. And at a certain point, it turns into lawn. Actually, the property, residential property that's behind this lot, um, it's like on the other side of that swale I showed you pictures of, 
it's just a lawn area, but it's, you know, they must have, it'd be like sort of a wet meadow in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, any comments from anybody from the public? Okay, so I don't see any, um, unless there's any other comments from um, commissioners, I think we're ready to move. So Aaron, could you help set us up for that? Sure. So um, my recommendation would be that the um, commission issue a negative determination under the Wetlands Protection Act um, with standard boilerplate conditions and a positive determination under the local bylaw approving the work to proceed with uh, um, the standard boilerplate under the local wetland protection bylaw and um, additional conditions would be that the plan be revised to include the items that were marked up as well as including um, boulders for the um, uh, a lot to be placed along the 50 foot no disturb and that the 50 foot would serve as the limit of work line, um, that there would be a 10 foot or so offset from that drainage swale to protect it during construction. And that invasives um, be removed off site and properly disposed of. I'm going for it. Okay. Making them. Oh, would I did I take your thunder, Laura? No, I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, so I move to make a negative determination under the Wetlands Protection Act, and we'll use the boilerplate conditions for that. And I move to make a positive determination under the wet, Amherst Bylaw Wetlands Protection Act with the boilerplate conditions, and that we the other conditions include putting in the boulders on the fifty foot for the work delineation, including the markups on the, on the plans from Aaron that have the swale for the 10 foot demarcation for limit, limit of work, including the culvert and all that. Invasives be removed and disposed appropriately, burned. And all right, I, I second it. that. I second that motion, Fletcher. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well done. So looking for a voice vote on this. Larry. Yes. Um, Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And Laura. Aye. And I for me as well. So Tom, this was a fairly quick and easy one. So we're we're good. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye, man. Thanks. Bye bye. See, See you soon. Yes. Okay, so uh, why don't we move on to what's listed as our 745, and this is a notice of intent, and so let me get the language up for that one. RFP. Okay. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands protection bylaw. This is a notice of intent that's being brought before us by Sherman and Frederick uh, LLC for Hampshire property management group for improvements to the existing drainage system at Amity place condominiums condos number 73 to 77, map 14A through lot one. And for the applicant, if you could raise your hand. Um, thank you. And just, okay, so Keith, you are now a panelist and we have to hit one more button. Nope. Um, okay, so we can see you, Keith and can't hear you yet though. Good evening, I'm Keith Terry with Sherman Frederick Land Surveying. 
Um, you. you can hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. And if you could provide a brief introduction to the project, that'd be most appreciated. Sure, great. Uh, so the Amity Place is a condominium uh, project uh, that's been constructed and um, they're having um, difficulties behind the units um, in the northeast corner of the property. The, uh, the, the units have actually had a drainage improvements behind them extending out to the wetlands previously. Uh, that's the existing conditions as you see it now. And um, so the, the issue is, is that the drainage system that they constructed, it was a, kind of a stone and trench uh, with perforated pipe. Uh, that's failed, uh, their, their system has failed in that area and they want to reconstruct it. So our proposal is to reconstruct it with a uh, uh, trench drain wrapped in fabric uh, and the trench drain will outlet, we could go to the sheet too, there you go. And the trench drain will outlet to a, um, a stone sump uh, down adjacent to the wetland. So the intention is to uh, place wetland, I'm sorry, place erosion controls limits on the edge of the wetlands um, and the proposed work is outside the wetland limit. Uh, we will have um, we have, we'll have open yard drains behind the units where the patios are and the roof leaders will be tied into this trench drain and it'll be open stone along the building until the first bend and at that point we're going to cap the trench drain with um, loam and seed, you know, filter fabric, loam and seed, so that the remainder of the drain will be hidden in a swale uh, coming down to the sump. That's uh, pretty much a, I'm gonna leave it at that and, and ask you guys to proceed with your questions, I guess. Unless you want me to talk about the disturbances in the, in the work zones buffer zones? Yeah, that'd be great. So this project is going to um, create approximately 2,795 square feet of disturbance in the 100 foot wetland buffer zone. You can see um, uh, at the bend, the trench all the way out to the wetland limit is that would be our disturbance area. And then the we um, measure approximately 805 square feet of disturbance within 30 foot offset to the wetland limit. The wetland uh, in this area is actually a, a pretty well-defined channel um, with obviously uh, uh, brush growth and some trees. Um, and if we didn't provide any photos or anything, but at the location of this sump, um, there's actually a footpath that someone is using to go into the neighboring property. So all of this disturbance that um, we're proposing is actually in um, currently disturbed, uh, currently disturbed uh, land. There's your, at the top of the photo is uh, the beginning of the footpath. Someone has dropped some uh, plywood in there so they don't, they're not stepping directly into the mud right there. So, so our limit of work is basically the limit of lawn, as you see. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. So do you guys mind if I just kind of jump in here and talk about the site visit? Please do. Okay. So um, the the plan that we just looked at, you sort of see the the um, improved drainage, and I will just just to make sure you guys are aware. This is we're talking we're not talking about anything coming off of a parking lot or anything that needs treatment. <clears throat> this is roof drainage, so we're talking you know clean water coming off of roofs. 
these are the existing catch basins they're looking to upgrade and improve. And then right now this water comes like almost like an underground French drain, um, sort of following our footsteps down this hill and then into this, um, there's a little sort of wetland stream um, down at the end of this where that board is. Somebody placed boards over it so they could get across the stream to the field on the other side. Um, I think this is a very simple, straightforward project for the most part. I think that the really the biggest um, questions for me on this are because the work is going to take between four and six weeks, what is the time of year when the work is going to be done? Because if it's done in the winter or the early spring, it could get really messy on the site in terms of um, the, the area needs to be excavated by a small piece of equipment. Um, a lot of material would be coming out of a trench and then they would be putting material, stone material and um, piping material as well as the catch basins to carry the water down to that little stone collection area at the base of the slope. Um, so I think time of year is really important and that was one question I asked on site. Um, my recommendation would be summer or low, low flow precipitation periods if possible. Um, I know they're having a problem right now with the system not working and backing up. So if they can't wait that long, then my recommendation would be um, one of two options. Either they excavate the areas that they need to and then immediately stabilize the areas where they're not working with um, uh, straw wattle check dams going down the slope and erosion control blankets or seed and mulch in the air in the areas along that slope or do the work in a phased approach in completing the work on top of the hill first to install those structures um, kind of um, <laughs> zipping that up and then moving down the slope and almost like a three-phase project complete the top then the middle then the bottom sort of in a phased configuration but um, Keith maybe you know more about I don't know if you were able to get to the bottom of when they wanted to do the work. So after our site visit the, today I gave a call to the contractor and I gave a call to the um, applicant and I did confirm that uh, if if possible they would like to do it during this uh, low precipitation in the middle of winter um, before spring uh, begins. They do understand that uh, they will have to, um, as you saw, said, uh, do it in phases and, uh, you know, uh, manage their exposed soils, um, uh, you know, to a tight degree. And yes, they would start uh, up by the, the patios and they would, uh, as you said, had to, they would have to phase through uh, down to the base of the, of the project because, um, you know, they, it's tight quarters. They can't just stockpile soil off to the side or anything. Um, they will have to uh, uh, truck out and truck back in um, as they go. Uh, so, yeah, they, they don't have any, any argument about stabilizing mulching as they go. Uh, during the winter. And I apologize if I missed it, Keith, but the idea is that once everything's installed, it be everything's going to be basically returned to pre-construction conditions. So the sod or the, um, the lawn's going to be put back in. So the only place where the lawn won't be put back in oh, is right. um, outside the 100 foot buffer behind the building where the patios are, yeah. that's going to remain open stone so that they can capture the water the best they can. But yes, the remainder of it will be returned to a um, turf, okay. except for the, at the base is a, is a stone sump. The idea is that um, we don't want the water to be blasting out into the wetlands. We don't want any erosion at the end of the open pipe. Yep. And uh, we're going to have use native rounded stone um, so that the residents and whoever's, you know, pedestrian walking 
uh, you know, they don't have to fall onto those really angular riprap rocks that you'd see in other great places. But um, but yes, we'll everything will be turned back to turf. We're not looking to make anything impervious. Sounds good. Okay, so thank you, Keith. Thank you, Aaron. Other commissioners, any questions or comments on this one? Uh, so anybody from the public, if you want to virtually raise your hand. Okay, if not, I think we're ready to move on this one. So that's nice, very quick. So straightforward, um, you know, makes sense. So, okay, Aaron, can you help out with the, with the motion? Aaron, you're muted. Okay, there we go. I'm back. Okay, um, so um, the recommendation would be to issue an order of conditions with the um, standard boilerplate under Wetland Protection Act and local wetland protection bylaw. Um, I would recommend conditions for phased construction. Uh, I would recommend three phases based on the configuration of the proposed work to complete the work um, at the top of the slope by the behind the um, residences to install the catch basins first, um, do the excavation, install the underground um, structures, and then stabilize that area and then move to phase two, which would be the area between that area um, going down the slope and then phase three being the area at the bottom where the stone sump is going to be installed. Um, obviously there would be disturbance of the entire area so erosion controls would have to be installed prior to work beginning and any um, areas of disturbance that the area would have to be controlled with um, a straw wattle check dam going down that slope as well as either an erosion control blanket or straw and seed um, to keep material from moving um, when the areas are not being worked on. Thank you, Aaron. You know, I was starting to draft that and I'm sorry, Aaron. I was like, rigorously typing and when we got to I phase think, two I, I couldn't keep up so I think I may have gotten it if you want me to take a stab at it yes I don't know about it. <laughs> Fletcher stop it <laughs> all right um Fletcher's laughing at everybody all right uh so I move to issue um the order of oh my god order of conditions right Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. With the standard boilerplate language under the Wetlands Protection Act, as well as local bylaws, um, our conditions include three phases of construction. Uh, the phase one, complete the work at the top of the slope, installing catch basins and stable stabilization. Uh, phase two starts to go down the slope and then phase three is at the bottom of the slope. Um, all of this in erosion controls need to be installed prior to the start of work and any disturbance is to be controlled with straw waddles. Uh, Ooh, step dams. I don't think my typing caught Check. that right. Check, Check dams. dams. Thank you. And either an erosion control blanket or straw and seed to keep it from moving. Did I miss anything? All right. <laughs> Someone well, second me, please. <laughs> second you, Anna. Thank you. Okay. Nice job, team. For a, a voice <laughs> vote. So, Larry? Yes. Fletcher? Aye. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So thank you, Keith. So Aaron will be in touch with the paperwork. That's great. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Have a good one, man. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So those are all of our hearings. Um, and so at this point, we're moving on to other business. So is there a certain order you want to hit this, Aaron? Um, yeah, let's start with the request for certificate of compliance for Eversource, because I see Robin on, and I'm going to just promote her to panelist. 
Um, so um, there was a, um, sorry, priority structure project um, that was completed by Eversource. It was actually, the work was being done right around the time I started last year. The work was done being wrapped up right around that time. Um, and I had had the opportunity to go out and walk the sites multiple times. Um, I did, so the submitted request for certificate of compliance included photos of all the sites, which showed that the area was stable and the photos were taken back in October. So everything was very green. Um, I did sort of a spot check in three locations along the line, as opposed to all of the locations along the line, just for time reasons. And all the sites that I visited that were stabilized, vegetation had come back. Um, and I have some photos of a couple of those areas to just show you very quickly. Um, This is, I believe, up behind Amherst College. Just to give you a sense, this is where the, the um, um, swamp mats were in place. Yes. So these are all like where all the wetlands, all the wetlands, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I'm, we're standing Amazing. in the middle Amazing. of the wetland here. And so you can see it's it's all come back. Look what 15,000 mats can do. I know. It's, they're, it's really pretty awesome. Um, this is the area um, adjacent to Strong Street. And that material that you see in the front there, that's a, an old patch of um, black top that has apparently been there for quite a while. And it's not a Eversource related. <clears throat> it wasn't, th that was not part of the Eversource project and it wasn't done by Eversource. It was just material that was dumped there at some point in time. But um, it's all reed canary grass. It's invasive, but it's, you know, that's what's, gro that's what's growing there and that's, it's all stabilized. Um, this is the area of, um, at the intersection of State Street and Leverett Road. Uh, really uh, sort of like right, um, there's like a big, big mound of, um, it's like bedrock and riprap up there that they put the structure on. Um, there, this is the area, that little apple tree on the other side that no work was done there, but they did have erosion controls there, but the area just looked completely stable. And then the area, this is in front and you can see the area in front, they never even touched this. Um, they just stayed up on the up on the hill. So those were the, the three areas that I picked out to visit just to, to kind of spot check and everything was very stable. So um, based on my site visits and review, I would recommend that we issue a certificate of compliance for DEP number 89-655. And just one point of clarification, um, this is something different than the current Eversource line work that's in front of us as well so there's right the, this yeah. is the quote unquote older one yes yeah. yep this work was completed on for priority structures that needed replacement um the other one is to replace all the remaining structures that weren't replaced initially yeah. thank you aaron robin is there anything you'd like to add oh no i guess i'll just um well i guess yeah i will add one thing um that for the upcoming project for the full rebuild the road locations and matted areas will be in the same locations that they were for the priority structure project. Um, so the there won't be additional impact. It'll go back into those areas. We'll do all the same inspections and report back on those. Great, thank you. Okay, so any commissioners have any questions on this one? I've seen some of these just through travels and yeah, everything looks good out there from what I've seen as well. Uh, we have nobody from the public left, so no public comments. Want we make a motion? Please. Yeah. How about I make a motion for um, to order a certificate of compliance for Eversource under DEP number 089-0655? Second. Okay. So looking for a voice vote on this one. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Fletcher? 
Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? And I from me as well. So we are good with this. So thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Okay, so Aaron, next on the hit list. Yeah, so another request for certificate of compliance. Um, I walked out there today. This one is a very, very unusual. Um, it's not an order of conditions. It's a determination of applicability that the commission required be recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Um, it's, a, it's an older one from 1997. Um, and basically this is just really uh, unorthodox. And uh, you know, I walked the site, I'll show you photos. Um, there's clearly nothing has gone on there for a very long time. The site's totally stable. It's basically um, just a regular residential um, backyard side here there is a stream that runs along which is clearly the reason why they had um, uh, you know had to file in the first place because this little little intermittent stream that runs along their property but um, and the house is is relatively close to that stream um, but yeah I would I would recommend that the commission issue a certificate of compliance to release this determination of applicability Okay. I don't so I'll any... make that motion to uh, <laughs> to certificate of compliance for the uh, RFD nine seven dash zero five seven five. Second. Okay. So voice vote on this one, Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So Where's Arlington Road? It's off of like where Moody Bridge turns into West Palm. Oh. I just had to look it up. It's, it's off like of another there. part of town. I across, never go to. Like across, yeah, across from Hickory Ridge. Got it. Yeah. All the way down yeah. in South Amos for you. Yes, I can't, I can't go that far. Yeah. It's pretty scary down here. I'd stay away. Yeah, right. Yeah, you and Larry <laughs> down there. Yeah, we hold it down. You guys, you all don't need to come down here. It's fine. We got it. Okay, so Aaron, next. Yeah. Okay. So, um, monitoring reports. Nothing. Nothing really to report there. Um, there was a DPW sanitary sewer overflow um, that Beth reported to me. Um, I think it was about 500 gallons um, that came out of the sewer system on the corner of. I believe it was Whitney Street, and I can't remember the name of the other road that comes off Whitney, but um, about 500 gallons that came out into the road and um, was captured in the catch basins along the roadway. Um, I had asked Beth if there was any impacts to Farringbrook. She said that the material never made it that far. It was captured by the catch basins and was treated with lime. So this is another one of those um, ongoing situations that um, happens from time to time. Um, enforcement updates. I've been in touch with as a result of I mentioned a, a meeting or two ago, um, just to follow up from a complaint on 99 Pulpit Hill Road, there had been an enforcement order last summer out there to restore some plantings. And um, we were supposed to have a report from um, uh, the monitors basically that indicated the success of the plants that were planted last this past summer and that report never came in. Um, I was in touch with the landowner and also with the consultant for the landowner and they're going to submit the plan to us sometime in May or June and I do have that on my calendar for that time to follow up with them. <laughs> um, poor farm restoration project. We um, myself and um, Rebecca Zimmerer from Na uh, Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program, we worked out a schedule with um, Sabina Knoyer's um, consultant for us to basically um, by early March have a restoration plan before the commission and hopefully um, approved around that time. So uh, in the meantime, they're going to be submitting some draft plans to 
to us for review and comment. And we'll kind of be going through a process of review and revision with them until they submit a final plan for us to be approved by you um, that meets the requirements of natural heritage. Carver Ave, um, I did issue them ratified enforcement order and also the three month extension for their order of conditions and did ask for an update for this evening to um, let us know the status of the reflagging and I have not heard anything back from them. Are you uh, talking about Canton Ave? Yeah, did I say Carver? Oh, I okay. always mix those two names okay. up. Why like, do I do Now that? where's Carver Ave? Okay. Canton, excuse me, sorry yeah. about that. That was a no typo. Sweat. Um. So yeah, but on that particular one, I think I'm gonna have to, I mean, I would almost, recommend that the commission set a deadline for the reflagging um, because I think that if if the commission is um, doesn't set a deadline I'm not sure that it's gonna um, be an incentive for them to move it along but it's it's really up to you guys how you want to do it but for that one Aaron can you remind us how long we did the I'll just call it the temporary um, extension yeah, it was three months. I believe we gave them till the end of February. I think that's right. I believe it was end of February that we gave them till. Yeah, I mean, so if they don't get their acting gear by then, then yeah, I mean, we close. So <laughs> I'm not sure how much more incentive they need. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do think that they filled a wetland in there, but. Um, you guys already know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so anyways, we can we can play it by ear. I can definitely follow up with them again. I asked them for an update and didn't get one for tonight, but um, just to let you know kind of the status of that. Um, <clears throat> another big elephant in the room this evening, uh, 51 East Pleasant Street, it's the old Bertucci's parking lot. Um, earlier this week, they were out there excavating, um, excavating the parking lot. They had not filed any permits with the town. They just kind of uh, move forward, I guess, um, with the excavation. And so um, the work was obviously discovered and um, we held an internal meeting with the representatives for the owner. And basically I laid out all of the requirements. Um, they, so basically where things stand uh, is that they excavated a small portion of the parking lot. Uh, it's currently exposed. So they pulled up the asphalt. There are catch basins within that area that have had um, silt sacks placed in them to protect them temporarily uh, while they're, while the parking lot's exposed. And they've also put up some erosion controls as well. Um, what they would like to do, what they would like for the commission to approve tonight is for them to basically just patch pave the area that they excavated without a permit just to seal it for the winter so that we don't have um, sediment pouring into those catch basins all winter long. So if they could patch pave it and then they've been advised that they need to hire a wetland scientist to map the wetlands to um, and an engineer to evaluate the catch basins because Farring Brook is about two feet below the parking lot there. Um, make sure everything's functioning properly, see if they need to replace any structures um, and then basically redesign the parking lot to meet um, redevelopment standards. So that's what they're asking is to basically just patch the area that they um, excavated in, in error. Um, and what were they trying to do? They were trying to to repave the whole parking lot. They thought that they didn't realize they needed permits to do that. Right, because Tam Brooks, right, that goes right towards it, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, there's Tan Brook goes a beer can, so whatever, right? Right. Yeah. Tan Brook does go underneath the parking lot, and there is a small swale on the on the side of the parking lot as well. Um, they said they didn't know it was wet and that they didn't know that they needed a permit. Um, so. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, now they do know. And so uh, it's kudos to whoever caught that. And um, yeah, I mean, that makes sense that we should, you know, seal it up and then they'll come before us and in due process. So. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this one or? What, what, do we vote on it? I would recommend that you make a motion to allow them to seal the um, excavated portion of the parking area for the winter until they can file a notice of intent. Um, Aaron, my only question is and your slide deck said see communications and I just wanted to make sure I'm not seeing that in the folder. Is oh. it somewhere that I'm missing? It came in just in the last day or so, so I'm not sure I got it. Oh, okay, on the, no worries. I, but I can, to... it basically conveyed, so <laughs> um, they they asked for more. They asked okay. basically, they asked for, they, they asked the commission to consider tonight allowing them to just move forward with the entire repaving. And I said, that's not it like a no. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't commit a violation and then get to move forward with your whole project no. and wrap it up to, uh, before winter. You could I try. Said, <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah, they did give it a shot. They uh, did, yeah. <laughs> I let them know that they can't do that and that basically the only thing that, that they can do at this point is is uh, okay. patch the area that they've disrupted and then file a permit to do the rest. Mm -hmm. So well, all right, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't, if you wanted us to have read everything really thoroughly, I wasn't not doing that. Oh, they've been, they've been very thoroughly warned in writing by me. And... I totally have so much faith in you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna make a motion. Um, we don't have to vote though, do we? Just, okay, making a motion to seal the excavated area um, for the winter time, so. Um, and then, you know, bring back to us a notice of intent um, come spring. Yep. Or any additional work is done. Or any additional work is done, bolded and underlined. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay, voice vote. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Aye as well. We're getting towards the bottom here, Aaron. Well, I just wanted to, to comment. You guys are like turning into a well-oiled machine. I don't know if it's me or if oh, it's, it's you, you, but it's you. It's for sure you. <laughs> no, that's that's all I have for tonight. And I am blown Great. away that we made it through everything at 915, 920. You have us well trained at this point, Aaron. So yeah. uh, with that being said, we are looking for a final motion. I move, we adjourn this meeting. Second. Uh, second. Seconded. Yeah, we're all seconded. Look at that. We're pumped out. How do you vote? Oh, am I? I. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. Okay. So Fletcher said I. Anna. I. Larry. I. Leroy. I. Laura. I. And I, for me as well, we are officially done, and I am stopping.